Good morning. Wache, bonjour, Ani, Kwekwe. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And thank you to everyone who's outside of the Timmins area who is joining us. Really wonderful to see all of you. I know for some of you, it's your very first day in District School Board Ontario Northeast. So for those people, if we just could give them a round of applause and welcome them. And I'm not going to ask those new people to stand. Uh, I would like to start uh, by welcoming the trustees who are able to join us this morning. We do have our chair with us, and he is going to bring a few words in a moment. Uh, I know we have some trustees who are at some of our schools. I'd also like to welcome our union presidents. I know uh, we have JP here in the audience, and I think we have some also in some of our schools. In order to start our day in a good way, uh, we are going to do a territorial acknowledgement. And I'd like us to acknowledge the Ojibwe territory in which we are situated, which is part of the Metogamy First Nation in Treaty 9. I'd also like to recognize the Métis people who have chosen this land to settle on. And I do recognize for those of you not in Timmins that your land acknowledgement will differ slightly from ours. At this point, it's my privilege to invite our chair, Bob Brush, up to give you some information this morning. Welcome, Bob. I need my helpers. Well, when I came in this morning, there's definitely a buzz in the air. And I say to you, good morning to all, uh, in particular to our remote sites from Hearst to Tomogamy and all points in between. So another school year is upon us, and I'm honored to be present this morning and to bring greetings from the Board of Trustees. 2018-19 promises to be a very exciting and rewarding year for all staff, students, and all employee groups. I trust that you had a relaxing summer the weatherman was certainly our best friend, as I don't remember one quite as warm and enjoyable. However, not everyone was fortunate enough to have vacations in the summer. And for those who worked on our behalf, we acknowledge your commitment and we say a special thank you very much. Now, for those who had to work, here's the good news. In checking the Farmer's Almanac, we're in for an extremely cold winter with above average snowfall. So I'm hoping your holiday will be at a remote Caribbean island in sun and surf. Boards are mandated to do a multi-year strategic plan. Uh, our last strategic plan was 2013 to 2018 and therefore a five-year plan. Uh, the board has worked hard in preparing a new three-year multi-year strategic plan. And I wanted to share briefly the journey that we were on as trustees and the senior administrative team in developing uh, a new strategic plan. So early in 2017, to meet with the mandate, uh, the board struck a strategic planning committee, which was comprised of the following trustees, Trustee Archibald, Brush, Cutton, Major, Osterberg, Pachowski, Shearer, and we were joined and supported by Director Leslie Dye, Superintendent of Business and Finance, Pearl Fong West, and Senior Manager of HR, James Rowe. Now someone could question, wow, nine people on a committee. But here was the advantage to it, uh, that many of our, well, 
not many. Some of our trustees uh, are still full-time professional people. Uh, it's difficult for all of us to meet at the same time. So by having nine, uh, I can say as an active member of that committee, it meant that we could get the work done that had to be done. So I thank those trustees and the senior administrative team for the valuable uh, support and input that they provided. Now the committee recommended that we search and hire a consultant to help us uh, develop the process. So we reached out uh, to Mr. Mike Sarita. Uh, Mike was the Executive Superintendent of Business Finance and Human Resources with the Thames Valley District School Board, uh, now retired uh, and very active uh, in his consulting business. So he took us through almost a full day exercise in evaluating our vision and mission statements that we had uh, used over the last five years. We then asked him to do an outreach and formulate a consultation process. And he did, and we held 20 consultation sessions. They involved students and parents, employee groups, trustees, community members, and business representatives from across the entire district. We held meetings in Kapuskasing, Cochrane, Iroquois Falls, Timmins, Kirkland Lake, Englehart, and Temiskaming Shores. The results of that outreach uh, surprised me pleasantly. So we got feedback from more than 2,000 participants in that journey, which generated more than 200 pages of notes and recommendations. So we sent Mr. Sarita away to hide in a closed room and spend the hours required to make some meaningful recommendations. The board held multiple meetings to consider and review and assess those recommendations and the results of this intense process is now before you in our new strategic plan 2018 to 2021. But the work is not done. The Director of Education has the responsibility to operationalize the plan. The Board of Trustees have the responsibility to share it with our communities, monitor the progress, review it annually, and revise as needed. So for the first part of today, we will deal further with our new strategic plan. Uh, it was a pleasure to be with you, and I want you to know that the board is working hard on behalf of all staff and all students, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Chair Brush. And I do want to echo our chair's words in terms of our staff that work this summer. Our schools look incredible. I've only been in a couple of them over the past couple of weeks, but it's been amazing to see those shining floors, all the desks cleans, all the chairs clean, and how important that is for our students tomorrow to come into our schools knowing that we value them and that our staff have worked that hard. I also uh, wanted to build on uh, Bob's comments about distributing the plan as, as far and wide. And I know he mentioned that was uh, part of the trustees role, uh, but Superintendent Plazic and I have been trying to help this morning. And whoever walked in those front doors this morning, in fact, staff working on the field, the track and field, students coming in for timetable changes, everyone was getting a copy of our strategic plan this morning. Hopefully you have a copy. If you don't, there are some at the, uh, the main entrance to the auditorium. As uh, Chair Brush said, we're going to spend the next uh, 
approximately, well, we're going to end at 10 o'clock, so the next uh, 49 minutes together. I am going to ask you to be having a conversation with the person beside you or in front of you or behind you. Uh, I, I know for many of you it's your first day back and me talking at you for an hour probably isn't the best way for you to come back. So I will be asking you uh, to engage with the person beside you. At this point, and I actually do want to comment on uh, all the images that you'll see today. These are our amazing DSB1 students. Uh, some of you might recognize that that uh, photograph comes from Golden Avenue. And then on the cover of our strategic plan, those are some students from Cochrane Public School. And again, love the images that you have sent to us over the last year and looking forward to gathering more images as we continue to share good news stories from DSB1. At this point, I'm going to, you can either follow along in your brochure or you can certainly use the slides. Uh, our vision is seven simple words. And our vision is something that we aspire to, but we actually don't ever get there. Because if we were ever to get there, then we need to revise our vision so that we still have that, that distance, that point that we're trying to achieve. And so at this point, we were very intentional. There was a group of about 35 of us. It was all of our trustees, our leads, our administrative council with Mike, really trying to make sure the words made sense. And we had a lot of conversation about the last two words, personal excellence. I'm going to ask you to turn to the person beside you if you don't know them, if you could please introduce yourselves. I'm thinking out in our remote uh, locations, you know each other. Okay, that, that's not the activity, but thank you for introducing yourselves. That is great. And I'm going to ask you, for the next five minutes, if you could chat with your partner about a time where you have achieved personal excellence. I know when we were doing this at our leadership conference a week ago, uh, the example I was sharing was about 30 years ago. Uh, it can be something that happened last year. It could be something that happened in your childhood. It could be something that happened over the summer. So I'm going to ask you uh, for five minutes to have that conversation. When I'd like everyone to come back, I am going to say thank you. And I'm hoping that's a signal that we can all come back. So you've got five minutes to have that conversation. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for having those conversations. I know the four of us that were chatting, uh, some of us were really thinking, well, I've done things well, but is that actually personal excellence? And then the other comment that we had was, well, if you achieve something, then do you change what that excellence is? We know that with our vision, the whole notion of all learners, that's each of us and all of our students. And so each day we're thinking about in what areas can we be achieving personal excellence. Our mission, and this hopefully looks familiar to you, it hasn't changed a lot from what we had before, is together we inspire innovation and a passion for learning. And that whole idea of together that's each of us, and it was really important to me. I know for some of you, uh, particularly our office staff, you might be thinking about what's building up in your office right now. Uh, you're with us. It was really important to me that all of our staff were with us this morning. As our chair mentioned, it's a brand new strategic plan. And while I'm really proud of our brochure, to me it's more than simply handing a brochure out to you. It's to make sure that we have an opportunity to talk about it. I know this venue isn't perfect for asking questions. Hopefully when you're back at your schools or in our, one of our board offices, if you have questions, please ask. You're welcome to email me. You're welcome to chat with your superintendents. Together, and I'm going back to our mission statement, we know that we can further serve our students in DSB1. When we're thinking about inspiring, we inspire ourselves. We inspire each other. We inspire our students. We inspire our families and our communities. We've landed on three priorities in our strategic plan. 
And those three priorities, and when you hear me mention them, I'm actually going to switch up the words. I think it's really important that we're not always starting with one of the priorities. We were asked actually here at Timmins High when we were doing consultation if one priority was more important than another. And it's not, and you'll see in our brochure, we've put them uh, across the page on the screen. Uh, to me, it's important when I talk about them that I will be uh, mixing them up and so that when we're communicating with our students and our families and our communities, they know that culture and innovation and equity are all important in DSB1. Innovation was in our old strategic plan equity and culture really came out. Our chair talked about the 200 pages that thankfully Mike went through for us. And those two words really came out from, from you, from our families, and particularly our students. As our chair said, our trustees are mandated to have a multi-year strategic plan. And so if we simply did it for the compliance, then it really, to me, would not be impactful. So we're going to spend about eight minutes watching Simon Sinek. He's an American author. Uh, one of his books, which I, I love his book, is Start With Why. Our strategic plan really defines why we exist as a school board. It's, help, it's used to monitor and evaluate our actions, and most importantly, it keeps us focused on what's truly important. So for the next eight minutes, we are going to listen to Simon Sinek. We assume even we know why we do what we do. But then how do you explain when things don't go as we assume? Or better, how do you explain when others are able to achieve things that seem to defy all of the assumptions? For example, why is Apple so innovative? Year after year after year after year, they're more innovative than all their competition. And yet, they're just a computer company. They're just like everyone else. They have the same access to the same talent, the same agencies, the same consultants, the same media. Then why is it that they seem to have something different? Why is it that Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement? He wasn't the only man who suffered in a pre-civil rights America. And he certainly wasn't the only great orator of the day. Why him? And why is it that the Wright brothers were able to figure out controlled, powered man flight when there were certainly other teams who were better qualified, better funded, and they didn't achieve powered man flight? And the Wright brothers beat them to it. There's something else at play here. About three and a half years ago, I made a discovery. And this discovery profoundly changed my view on how I thought the world worked, and it even profoundly changed the way in which I operate in it. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do, 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. 
If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We, have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. People don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. The goal is not to do business with, anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. Here's the best part. None of what I'm telling you is my opinion. It's all grounded in the tenets of biology not psychology, biology. If you look at a cross-section of the human brain looking from the top down, what you see is the human brain is actually broken into three major components that correlate perfectly with the golden circle. Our newest brain, our homo sapien brain, our neocortex, corresponds with the what level. The neocortex is responsible for all of our rational and analytical thought and language. The middle two sections make up our limbic brains, and our limbic brains are responsible for all of our feelings, like trust and loyalty. It's also responsible for all human behavior, all decision-making, and it has no capacity for language. In other words, when we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures. It just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures, and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision-making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you, those aren't other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision-making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody, how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you or more importantly, be loyal? At this point, I'm going to ask you to turn back to the partner with whom you were chatting and share with them why you do what you do in our amazing district. And so Simon talks about the what, the how. So we're not talking about the role that each of us has, but we're talking about why we do what we do. Five minute conversation. And again, I will use, uh, thank you as a way to bring us back.
thank you for chatting with your partner, whether it was the same partner or a different partner. We exist in District School Board Ontario Northeast to ensure that each of our students has a positive future story. I know in chatting with Sue and Ron and Bob this morning, each of us were thinking about a student or other students that we know is now successful in one of our communities as a result to, of going to one of our schools. So in other words, it's about empowering all learners to achieve personal excellence. I know you just had a conversation. Uh, I was with our office staff on Thursday and we had the privilege of uh, hearing, I thought, a wonderful keynote speaker. Uh, he's an OPP officer. And he asked us each the question about what brings us joy. He framed it around our world outside of work. Uh, I'm actually going to ask if we could frame this around our work that we do in District School Board Ontario Northeast. With your partner, and this is about kind of a, a three minute conversation, so each of you have approximately a minute and a half. Uh, you're asking your partner, what brings you joy? And you're listening to them. And then after about a minute and a half, if your partner will then ask you, what brings you joy? And I know that in, even in this room alone, and I certainly know uh, out in our schools and in our new Lizard Board office, we have very different roles in our organization and we exist to serve our students. If you could have that conversation about what brings you joy. Thank you. Interesting, and I know for our um, folks out uh, from Hearst to Tomogamy, uh, in our auditorium, the volume of that conversation was much louder than the earlier conversations. And so I appreciate you sharing what brings you joy in the role that you're in. And our chair was sharing when he was uh, a vice principal talking about making those phone calls to families on a Friday. And it reminded me of a student uh, in grade six when I was a principal in Ottawa. And often our parents at that school would, would not answer the phone when the school would call. Uh, so I got voicemail and I, the student, was ha Cody, was having a phenomenal day. I don't know if this has happened to you before, but I was leaving the message and I made a grammatical error. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, we'll just move forward. And then I saw the mom about six months later and she said, Leslie, I listen to that message every single day. She said that makes such a difference for her. And I thought, great, you're listening to my grammatical error every single day. But what was important was that she knew that not every day Cody had a good day, but he certainly could have good days. We're going to really make sure that in the time that we have remaining, that we have a strong understanding of what culture, equity and innovation mean in DSB1. I was going to ask you to do a turn and talk on this one, uh, but I, I don't think I will. We'll do it for innovation and for equity. And when we think about culture in DSB1, and this was really coming from the feedback that we received when we did our consultations, was that in DSB1, we're a culture of learning, we're a culture of high expectations, we're a culture of caring, that we're a culture of diversity, particularly when you think about the students that we are serving with special needs, our students who are living in poverty, our students who identify as Indigenous. When we say the word culture in DSB1 as a priority, those are all the things that we're thinking about in terms of our culture. For innovation, and innovation has been a priority of our, of our trustees, of our staff, and we certainly know that through the technology that each of us are provided with here in DSB1. Innovation is so much more than technology. So this is a quick conversation. It's a two-minute conversation uh, with your partner. When you hear the word innovation, what do you think about?
Thank you. When you were having your conversation, I'm sure you were chatting about innovation being something new, something different. I know that when we were chatting as administrative council a couple of weeks ago, we had this whole conversation about if we are truly innovative as an organization, is there a soft place for people to land if what they tried didn't quite work out? So that whole idea of you try something and it fails. Your intent was to get to a better place, but it didn't quite work out that way. And I know that we as administrative council are really committed to becoming more and more innovative with you. The only way that we, uh, we believe that we can get better is with working with you closely and listening to your ideas. In terms of equity, I'm going to ask you to have, uh, again, because this is a new one for us, I want to make sure that we all have a really clear understanding. Again, a two-minute conversation. When you hear the word equity, what comes to your mind? You've probably heard the expression that equity is about treating people according to their needs. I heard a great expression uh, last year, or a way to define equity, that equality or treating people on an equal, in an equal manner is about providing everyone with shoes. Equity is about ensuring that everyone has a shoe that fits for the context in which they're living. Equity is about opportunity. It's about removing barriers. And when we as administrative council were meeting a couple of weeks ago, I asked the question, if equity is about removing barriers, which it is in District School Board Ontario Northeast, how do we become aware of a barrier if we don't even know it exists? And so I think for me, one of the ways to figure that out is by talking with each other. We all have such rich, powerful stories, personal stories, and by sharing our ideas and by problem solving together, that's when I think we, we, under, we begin to understand what barriers, particularly for our families. When our families talk to us about barriers, or they may not be talking to us about barriers, they might be using a louder voice. But if we can understand what they're sharing with us, then I think we'll be able to move forward together. At this point, I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to invite you to join me in the 10-5 way. And I apologize that that's imperial. So it's 10 feet and five feet. Uh, it just doesn't sound as good as three decimal 48 thousandths meter to one decimal 524 thousandths meter. So we're gonna do the 10-5 way. The 10-5 way comes from the Ritz-Carlton. And as you might know, the Ritz-Carlton is a hotel chain across the world that probably has the highest ratings in terms of guest satisfaction. It also, the 10 way also then moved to medical communities. And what they have found in both settings is that things significantly improved for the clients. And so for us, that's our students. In fact, in the medical communities, uh, the death rates reduced significantly. The 10-5 way is that when someone is within 10 feet of us in DSB-1, then we're acknowledging them somehow non-verbally, whether it's through our eyes, through a wave, a gesture. The five feet way is that when that person is within five feet of us, we're verbally acknowledging them. And you probably know that in the English language, each of us, our favorite words, research will tell us, is our name. So if we know the name of the person, if we could verbally acknowledge them with their name. And I do want to thank our mental health lead, Denise Plant Dupuy, for sharing this with me. She shared it last spring. And when I think about equity and I think about culture, but then I also think about innovation because it's new for us, I really think that it would be something valuable for us 
to engage in. So I hope you will uh, engage with me on the 10-5 way. So I know some of you have been holding our brochure, others of you have uh, put it down if it could be in your hands at this point. And if you could just take a moment to walk through the plan and just on your own or quietly with the person beside, well, it doesn't have to be quiet, with the person beside you, uh, what do you notice? And what have we tried to ensure that people see is important in our plan? So this is about a two minute conversation. Thank you. So I, I'm not going to put anyone on the spot here in Timmins asking uh, what, you, what you noticed or what was important. I'm hoping that you're seeing that it's our students. The images in our document are students from the north, students from the central region, students from the south. I'm hoping you're seeing the expressions on their face, the joy that they're having. And also, I'm hoping that you're seeing that the classroom is in many places, that learning happens. As soon as our students come to our school at the beginning of the day, and then when they leave at the end of the day. If you could look at the front cover, and uh, this is our seventh version of the brochure. And one of the first versions, she actually only had, our designer, only had the student on the right. So if you could just maybe put your hand on the left and, and block out the student who's not as tall. And then remove your hand and then take a look at the whole image again. I'm hoping that you're seeing the image of the two students is so much more rich than the image of the one student. And what we did try to capture in our brochure is that learning happens with one another. And in most of those photographs, you're going to see students interacting with another student. As you walk through the document, and certainly our chair spoke about our eight commitments. And I'm hoping that either in your workplace or school today, certainly in our schools, when you begin to chat about school improvement planning, that you're looking as a staff at a commitment that makes sense to you based on the students that you serve. As a system, we have identified three, uh, and we did that through feedback from our managers, our leads, our vice principals, our principals, and our administrative council. So we have in our principals and vice principals um, are aware of the three that we're going to be focusing on specifically at the, at the system level. If there, and that will be shared with you later today. If there is a commitment that wasn't captured by the one that, the three that we're looking at, you're welcome to pay attention to it. It needs to be something that makes sense to you based on your experiences at your school. One of my favorite quotes and again, I, I do love Canadian authors. This happens to be an American, again. Uh, Todd Whitaker reminds us that every student begins the year undefeated. And I like to think about that as not only our students, but also each one of us. I, the one, one of the amazing things I think about education is that each year we have an opportunity to get even better than we were the year before. And most of us get a, a pretty substantial break to get some rest, to rejuvenate, to then come back and serve our students. I want to introduce you to Riker. Riker is on the back of our cover. Uh, Riker is a student, a year one kindergarten student. And I really, uh, I know most of us in education are probably reading that as kinder. I'm hoping that when we share this with our families and our communities, that they're reading that as kinder. That each and every day, District School Board Ontario Northeast is becoming a culture of kindness. More kind than we were, I was going to say yesterday, but that was Labor Day. But if we go a week forward, more kinder than the day we were. So as we come to a close, I, I want to thank you today for having conversations 
I know some of you, that might have been more than you were thinking was going to happen this morning. You th might thought you were going to be easing into uh, to your first day back. I want to wish everyone an amazing year. Thank you in advance for the work that you're going to do. Our students are incredible, and we know that they become more incredible due to you. So merci, miigwech, thank you.